In case you were wondering, the entire shell is made from stamped steel, including the base. That was their, web, uh, their website address and their phone number. Nice. Um, but it was all metal, uh, front and back. And it was built a little bit like an industrial computer, something that you would find in a, in a truck or attached to a machine. In fact, I'm pretty sure that uh, this OEM did, in fact, build machines like that. But as you can clearly see, this was custom-built for monorail, as it has their logo on the ribbon cable to the LCD panel. Um, here are the internal speakers, tiny little things. We have our display inverter board. We have only, oh, wow, oh, only has one um, fluorescent tube. Here's the onboard microphone, and this is the sound buffing, buffer kind of thing. Um, this tells you that it was made by MyTac. At least that board was. And before we crack it open, you'll see how it's laid out. This right here is the board that made it possible to add the um, the I/O port on the back. If Apple's engineers could figure out how to do something like this, um, you know, seven years later then uh, they would never have made the iMac G4 in a gumdrop looking base. Steve Jobs actually had in, in the, um, in the uh, keynote address when they announced the iMac G4 with the flat panel Luxo lamp style thing, he actually said that the engineers could not figure out, in so many words, could not figure out how to create a machine that was a flat panel with the entire system in the same box with the ports coming out the back. Well, Steve, this was done long before that announcement. <laughs> this was done in 1995 by an OEM PC builder, no less. They figured it out. Why couldn't you? But anyway, um, they did figure it out eventually when they created the iMac, Intel iMac. So, enough of that. Um, let's go ahead and... Uh, separate the screen from the rest of the machine. The key to liking Apple products is not drinking the apple kool-aid just fyi appreciate them for what they are not what they tell you they are so anyway we have a very innovative product on our hands that um, unfortunately didn't sell very well largely because of the onboard display and uh, lack of expansion and upgradeability options in fact, one of the um, articles had mentioned that it was you would void your warranty if you crack the case open. <laughs> yeah, that didn't go over so well. Now we have to separate this interconnect board from the motherboard like so. And then we have a couple of connectors we have to undo. Let me pull this away. So we have the two IDE cables and a power cable. And I don't know if my camera can see this. I'll try to move it a little bit. Right here is the floppy cable. So I'll give it a firm grasp, pull it out. And here is the IDE cable going to the optical drive and the hard drive. Uh, just the optical drive, actually. This, this does have two IDE buses. There we go. And here is the power cable. Okay. That powers the motherboard. So we're going to just pull this away and set it aside. Okay. Now you are at the back of the machine here. Here is the cooling fan, obviously. 
nice NMB ball bearing fan, awesome. Um, here's the floppy drive. Now this is the new power connector. What I did, <clears throat> I actually made it look as though it was never replaced. The only reason you'd know if, if, that it was ever done was the fact that I'm telling you on camera. Now, this is exactly how the original um, connector was connected or hooked up. What I did was I unsoldered all three leads from the original connector and um, they were shrink wrapped or shrink tube wrapped and I soldered them to this used connector by unsoldering the wires and um, I then I sleeved each connection with shrink tubing. This is exactly as the original one was done, so you would never know the difference unless I said something, and here we are. Here's the original power supply. Now I'm going to tell you another story. I worked for a company that manufactured... So we're going to move our attention to this panel here. What we have here is the LCD panel, but on the reverse side, I'm going to lay down a, a mouse pad here so we can scratch it up here. On the other side, we have the main logic board and the hard drive. So here we are. This is the Rockwell modem chipset, I imagine. Um, in fact, I believe that is part of the modem as well. And uh, all that circuitry, there should be a, um, backplane connector. And here's our 16-bit expansion slot. What's troubling about this expansion slot is that while it will support any 16-bit card electronically, physically it can't. If you haven't figured out why, I'll tell you. Now, we have a removable cover here. It is not equipped to handle a, um, a, a backplane um, style uh, plate. And if I were to put any card in this slot, maybe a small 8-bit, but no. What would happen is it would block off the fan um, and it would not cool the adjacent CPU heat sink. It would cause the machine to overheat. And that's in addition to the um, heat that it itself generates, whatever card you put in. So expansions on this machine are limited to whatever you can plug into the outside, basically. The company never officially supported using this slot for anything. Uh, they may have some, or may have had plans to have internal upgrades that they would offer the customer, but um, I have no proof of that other either way, so. I think what I'm going to do with this battery is play it by ear and um, or just make up a make up a, um, a battery for it. I'm going to assume that it's probably 3.6 volts. So I might wire in a, uh, a coin cell. But unfortunately, I can't really tell what the voltage is. I don't see any markings on it. Oh yeah, there there are there, but they're you know what? Let's pull it out. And that's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna desolder this battery, and we're gonna see what it is. And I'll make something up at work uh, tomorrow and put it put it in its place. And that's where the battery used to be. And here it is now. I've pried off the um, contact that was tack welded to it. It is a Panasonic 3 volt. It's a BR, B as in Bob, 1225. Well, I am not going to buy a BR1225, but I have a CR2025, and I'm going to now solder wires to it. Not recommended. <laughs> uh, there's a reason that you're not supposed to solder to these, um, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, 
what I'm going to do is sand off on each side a little bit of um, a little bit of the uh, chrome or whatever coating is on the battery. I believe it's actually chrome. It is a uh, <clears throat> coating that resists solder and corrosion. Soldering to this battery is not a good idea. I could easily buy the correct battery or perhaps buy one with leads already on it. Um, but I don't do things that way sometimes. So here we go. Okay, solder work is done. Battery cable is run. I've decided to relocate the battery using the same method used when companies decide to rework motherboards. Here's the new battery. Now the first thing you're going to say is how did you solder leads to the battery and why? Well, what I did was something that I do not recommend you do. It is absolutely not a good idea to solder leads to a coin cell battery. It is actually quite stupid. Because what can happen is if you let the battery temperature get too high, it'll not explode, but it will burst. And uh, if the temperature is too low, the joint will fail. The bond will fail. So what I did was I used a 40 watt iron and I used, um, because silver solder has a tendency to have a higher melting point and requires more time um, against the iron tip for it to properly bond. So I use old fashioned 6040 uh, which is uh, with, with the clear flux built in. Um, I find that it gives you it melts almost instantly and um, you don't have to let the battery get too hot for it to bond. Um, so anyway, as a result, I have a nice tight bond. Um, before I soldered to the battery, I, um, I scuffed it with sandpaper to remove any, uh, any coatings. It, helps them, it actually helps improve the bond. Um, but soldering to these batteries is generally a bad idea. Um, you can buy them with the leads already on them. But in the uh, spirit of just let's get this done right now so I can go to bed, um, I took some shortcuts that I don't recommend. The other thing, once you do this, the best way to package this battery, and it would look like it was OEM, is to shrink tube it. You just take a piece of um, wide shrink tube, run it over the battery, and then slightly heat it up, done. As a matter of fact, when you buy a coin cell battery with leads already soldered to it, or actually what they do is they tack weld it, um, as the old battery was. It'll look, when you buy them like that, they actually are covered in a, a shrink tube-like substance. So it would be brilliant. But I don't have shrink tubing that big, and I'm not going to go buy some just for this. So I'm going to use electrical tape. But I'm going to wrap it nice and tight. And now time for a little lesson in Look at the freaking legends on the board before you solder things to them. If you look over here... Oh, I woke up my EMAC. Alright, whoops. Anyway, if you look over here, you'll see this plus BT1. I'm thinking, okay, that's plus battery terminal 1. And I'm thinking that that plus meaning positive is this terminal here. And then I look at this terminal here, which doesn't have any denotions at all. Uh, look at the battery legend, you moron. Look at that. I'll right side it up for you. As everyone knows, a coin cell battery has a positive and a negative. The positive is, well, in my experience, always the flat side of the battery. The negative is the small indent on the round side of the battery. Here's the old battery. You can't really see it because it's, it's wrapped up. But positive is the flat side. You see? Negative is the rounded side. Look at the legend. 
and you'll get it right. I got it wrong. So I don't know yet if I fry this uh, motherboard, but I see a couple of diodes here. Hopefully one of them absorbed the, um, the, the reverse current uh, while I had, um, for the hour or so, this thing was assembled. <sighs> well, I fixed the problem. I didn't want to re-solder here. I just want to leave that alone. So I just took the battery. Um, I, I unsoldered the, the wires quickly flip them around and uh, hopefully no one will have to service this thing in the future. But anyway, we'll put it back together and see what happens. Okay, now is when we find out if I've caused serious damage to my motherboard. I've never reversed polarity on a CMOS battery, but then again. Um, alright, I've already made the BIOS settings and saved them and all that, so here we go. See what's gonna happen. I think we're good. I set the date to 1990. Boots right into Windows. Thank God. Because not only did I have a lot of time invested in this machine, I also have a lot of hopes and dreams for it. I actually want to use this as my primary Windows 95 machine. But here it is, while it's all apart and everything. You can see it uh, working live and everything looks pretty good. So we got to pop the cover back on and we're going to call this a done deal. It's really late and I have to go to bed so I'm going to clean up all my stuff tomorrow. So. Hooray!